Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the second quarter of 2022. Welcome to Lesson 2 on the series of Genesis. It's titled The Fall and is ready for teaching on April 9. And my name's Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, April 2. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. We thank you for this mighty book of Genesis, which teaches us so much about you, about your love, your grace, your power, and your care for us. And as we open your word this week, as we look at the story of Jesus in one way, as we look at the gospel, as we look at how you relate to us, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. And today I'd like to pray for people all around the world who are experiencing problems with COVID and the infection that is just killing and infecting so many people. But I'd also like to pray for those who are listening in Ottawa, in the United Arab Emirates, in Washington or Nairobi or Vienna or Mozambique or Rio de Janeiro or Beechmere or Durban. In all these places, Lord, and wherever people are listening, I pray that your Holy Spirit will not only guide us, but be our comfort this day in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Genesis chapter 3 and 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Let's read that again, Genesis 3 and verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Amid all that God had given our first parents in Eden, also came a warning in Genesis 2, verses 16 and 17. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This warning against eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil shows us that though they were to know good, they were not to know evil. We certainly can understand why, can't we? And two, the threat of death attached to the warning about disobedience in verse 17 would be fulfilled. They would die, as it said in Genesis 3.19, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Not only forbidden to eat from the tree, they also were driven from the Garden of Eden, as we read in Genesis 3.24. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life, and thus had no access to what could have given them eternal life as sinners, as you read in verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live forever. However, amid this tragedy comes hope, which is found in Genesis 3 verse 15, called the Proto-Evangelium, or the First Gospel Promise. Yes, this verse presents the first gospel promise found in the Bible, the first time humans are told that, despite the fall, God has made a way of escape for us all. Genesis 3.15 And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Sunday, April 3, The Serpent 
Read Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, 2 Corinthians 11, 3, and Revelation 12, 7 to 9. Who is the serpent, and how does he deceive Eve? Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And 2 Corinthians 11, 3. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And Revelation 12, beginning at verse 7, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The text begins with the serpent. The syntax of the phrase suggests emphasis. The word serpent is the first word of the sentence. Also, the serpent has the definite article, indicating that this is a well-known figure, as if the reader already should know who he is. The reality of this being is thus affirmed from the first word of the chapter. Of course, the scriptures identify the serpent as the enemy of God in Isaiah 27 verse 1, In that day the Lord with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan the fleeing serpent, Leviathan that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. And explicitly call him the devil and Satan, as we've just read in Revelation 12, verse 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Likewise, in the ancient Near East, the serpent personified the power of evil. We read in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53, In order to accomplish his work unperceived, Satan chose to employ as his medium the serpent, a disguise well adapted for his purpose of deception. The serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful creatures on the earth. It had wings, and while flying through the air, presented an appearance of dazzling brightness, having the colour and brilliancy of burnished gold. End of quote. When talking about the devil, in whatever form he appears, the Bible is not using mere metaphor. In Scripture, Satan is depicted as a literal being, and not just some rhetorical symbol or an abstract principle to depict evil or humanity's dark side. The serpent does not present himself as an enemy of God. On the contrary, the serpent refers to God's words, which he repeats and seems to support. That is, right from the start, we can see that Satan likes to quote God and, as shall later be seen, even quotes the word of God itself, as we read in Matthew 4 and verse 6, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Note also that the serpent does not argue immediately with the woman, but he asks a question that implies that he believes in what the Lord has said to them. After all, he said, Has God indeed said, in Genesis 3 verse 1, Thus, even from the start, we can see just how cunning and deceitful this being was, and as we will see, it worked too. So to finish the day, if Satan was able to deceive a sinless Eve in Eden, how much more vulnerable are we? What is our best defence against his deceptions?
Monday, April 4, The Forbidden Fruit Read Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, and Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Also have a look at John 8, 44. Compare the words of God's commandment to Adam with the serpent's words to the woman. What are the differences between the speeches, and what is the meaning of these differences? Genesis 2, beginning at verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And Genesis 3, 1 to 6. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. And John 8 verse 44. You are of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar, and the father of it. Note the parallels between God's conversation with Adam in Genesis 2, 16 and 17 and Eve's conversation with the serpent. It is as if the serpent has now replaced God and knows even better than he does. At first he merely asked a question, implying that the woman had perhaps misunderstood God. But then Satan openly questioned God's intentions and even contradicted him. Satan's attack concerns two issues, death and the knowledge of good and evil. While God clearly and emphatically stated that their death would be certain in chapter 2 verse 17, Satan said that on the contrary they wouldn't die, stating that humans were immortal in Genesis 3 verse 4. You shall not surely die. While God forbade Adam to eat the fruit in Genesis 2.17, Satan encouraged them to eat the fruit because by eating of it, they would be like God, as we read in Genesis 3.5. Satan's two arguments, immortality and being like God, convinced Eve to eat the fruit. It is troubling that as soon as the woman decided to disobey God and eat the forbidden fruit, she behaved as if God were no longer present and had been replaced by herself. The biblical texts allude to this shift of personality. Eve uses God's language. Eve's evaluation of the forbidden fruit saw that was good in Genesis 3, 6, reminds us of God's evaluation of his creation, saw that it was good in Genesis 1, verse 4, and several other texts in Genesis chapter 1. These two temptations, those of being immortal and of being like God, are at the root of the idea of immortality in ancient Egyptian and Greek religions. The desire for immortality, which they believed was a divine attribute, obliged these people to seek divine status as well, in order, they hoped, to acquire immortality. Surreptitiously, this way of thinking infiltrated Jewish Christian cultures and has given birth to the belief in the immortality of the soul, which exists even today in many churches. And so to finish today, think of all the beliefs out there today that teach there's something inherently immortal in all of us. 
How does our understanding of human nature and the state of the dead provide us such powerful protection against this dangerous deception? Tuesday, April 5, Hiding Before God Read Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 to 13. Why did Adam and Eve feel the need to hide before God? Why did God ask the question, Where are you? How did Adam and Eve seek to justify their behaviour? Genesis 3, beginning at verse 7, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And the woman said, The serpent deceived me. And I ate. After they sinned, Adam and Eve felt naked because they lost their garments of glory, which reflected God's presence. Let's look at Psalm 8, verse 5. For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honour. And Psalm 104, verses 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord my God, you are very great. You are clothed with honour and majesty. You cover yourself with light as with a garment, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain. The image of God had been affected by sin. The verb make in the phrase they made themselves coverings in Genesis 3-7 was so far applied only to God the Creator, as we see in Genesis 1 verse 7, thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And verse 16, Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And verse 25, And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. It is as if they replaced the Creator as they attempted to cover their sin, an act that Paul denounces as righteousness by works in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law... No flesh shall be justified. When God approaches, he asks them the rhetorical question, Where are you? in Genesis 3 verse 9. The same kind of question that God will ask Cain in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Of course, God knew the answers to the questions. His questions were asked for the benefit of the guilty to help them realise what they have done, and yet, at the same time, to lead them to repentance and salvation. From the moment humans sinned, the Lord was working for their salvation and redemption. In fact, the whole scenario reflects the idea of the investigative judgment, which begins with the judge who interrogates the culprit. 
as we saw in Genesis 3 verse 9, in order to prepare him for the sentence in Genesis 3, 14 to 19. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel." To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return." But he does it also to prompt repentance, which will ultimately lead to salvation, as we read just before in Genesis 3.15. This is a motif seen all through the Bible. At first, as is so common with sinners, Adam and Eve both try to evade the charge, seeking to blame others. To God's question, Adam responds that it was the woman whom God had given to him in verse 12. She led him to do it. It was her fault, and implied that it was God's as well, not his. Eve responds that it was the serpent who deceived her. The Hebrew verb nasha, N-A-S-H-A, or deceive, in Genesis 3.13, means to give people false hopes and makes them believe that they are doing the right thing. As we read in 2 Kings 19, verse 10, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. And Isaiah 37, and verse 10, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. And Jeremiah 49, verse 16, Your fierceness has deceived you, the pride of your heart. O you who dwell in the clefts of the rock, who hold the height of the hill. Though you make your nest as high as the eagle, I will bring you down from there, says the Lord. Adam blames the woman, saying that she gave him the fruit, some truth to this, and Adam blames the serpent, saying he deceived her, some truth to this too. But in the end, they both were guilty. And so to finish the day, trying to blame someone else for what they have done, Why is it so easy for us to fall into the same trap? Wednesday, April 6, The Fate of the Serpent Genesis 3.15 reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. What did the Lord say to the serpent here, and what hope is implied in these verses? God begins his judgment with the serpent because he is the one who initiated the whole drama. The serpent, too, is the only being who is cursed in this narrative. We reach here a kind of reversal of creation. While creation led to life, the appreciation of good and blessings, judgment leads to death, evil and curses, but also to the hope and promise of salvation. Attached to the sombre picture of the crushed serpent eating the dust of Genesis 3.14, 
let's read that. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Shines the hope of the salvation of humankind, which appears in the form of a prophecy. Even before the condemnations of Adam and Eve, which will follow, the Lord gives them the hope of redemption in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Yes, they have sinned. Yes, they will suffer because of their sin. And yes, they will die too because of their sins. But despite all that, there is the ultimate hope, the hope of salvation. Compare Genesis 3.15 with Romans 16.20, Hebrews 2.14 and Revelation 12.17. How is the plan of salvation, as well as the great controversy, revealed in these texts? Genesis 3.15, and I'll put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel and Romans sixteen twenty, and the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And Hebrews chapter two verse fourteen Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil and revelation 12:17 and the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of god and have the testimony of jesus christ notice the parallels between genesis 3:15 and revelation 12:17 the dragon the serpent is enraged enmity the seed, offspring, and the woman in Eden, and the woman in Revelation 12.17. The battle, the great controversy that moved to Eden with the fall, will continue to the end of time. However, the promise of Satan's defeat already was given in Eden, and that his head will be crushed, a theme more explicitly revealed in Revelation, which depicts his final demise in Revelation 20 and verse 10. The devil, who deceived them, was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night, for ever and ever. That is, right from the start, humanity was given hope that there will be a way out of the terrible mess that came from the knowledge of evil, a hope that we all can share in right now. So to finish the day, why is it so comforting to see that in Eden itself, where sin and evil on earth began, the Lord started to reveal the plan of salvation? Thursday, April 7. Human Destiny. Read Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 to 24. As a result of the fall, what happened to Adam and Eve? Genesis 3, beginning at 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Then to Adam, he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. 
And Adam called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now, lest he put out his hand, and take also of the tree of life, and eat and live for ever, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden, to till the ground from which he was taken. So he drove out the man, and he placed cherubim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. While God's judgment of the serpent is explicitly identified as a curse in Genesis 3.14, God's judgment of the woman and of the man is not. The only time the word curse is used again is when it is applied to the ground in Genesis 3.17. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. That is, God had other plans for the man and the woman as opposed to the serpent. They were offered a hope not offered to him. Because the woman's sin is due to her association with the serpent, the verse describing God's judgment of the woman was related to the judgment of the serpent. Not only does Genesis 3.16 immediately follow Genesis 3.15, but the parallels between the two prophecies also clearly indicate that the prophecy concerning the woman in Genesis 3.16 has to be read in connection to the messianic prophecy in Genesis 3.15. Let's read that, Genesis 3.15 and 16. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. God's judgment of the woman, including childbearing, should therefore be understood in the positive perspective of salvation, as we compare this with 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love and holiness with self-control. Because the man's sin is due to listening to the woman instead of listening to God, the ground from which man had been taken is cursed, we read in verse 17 of Genesis chapter 3. As a result, man will have to work hard, as we read in verses 17 to 19, and he will then return to the ground where he comes from. Verse 19, something that never should have happened, and that was never part of God's original plan. It is significant that against this hopeless prospect of death, Adam turns then to the woman where he sees the hope of life through her giving birth. As we read in verse 20, And Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. That is... Even amid the sentence of death, he sees the hope of life. As any loving parent, God had wanted only good for them, not evil. But now that they knew evil, God was going to do all that he could to save them from it. Thus, even amid these judgments, all hope was not lost for our first parents, despite their open and blatant disobedience of God. Even though they, living truly in paradise, had absolutely no reason to doubt God, to doubt God's words, or to doubt his love for them. And so, to finish today, though we tend to think of knowledge in and of itself as good, why is that not always the case? What are some things that we are better off not knowing?
Friday, April 8. Consider the connection between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This relation already is suggested through the fact that they are both located in the midst of the garden, as we read in Genesis 2 verse 9. But there is more between the two trees than just a geographical location. It is because humans have taken the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because they disobeyed God, that they lost access to the tree of life and could not live forever, at least in this condition. Their connection underlies a profound principle. Moral and spiritual choices have an impact on biological life, as Solomon instructed his son in Proverbs 3, verses 1 and 2. Do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands for length of days and long life and peace. They will add to you. This connection reappears in the future heavenly Jerusalem, where only the tree of life is present in the middle of its street, as we read in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2. And Ellen White writes in Testimonies for the Church, volume 3, page 484, When God created Eve, he designed that she should possess neither inferiority nor superiority to the man, but that in all things she should be his equal. The holy pair were to have no interest independent of each other, and yet each had an individuality in thinking and acting. But... After Eve's sin, as she was first in the transgression, the Lord told her that Adam should rule over her. She was to be in subjection to her husband, and this was a part of the curse. In many cases, the curse has made the lot of woman very grievous and her life a burden. The superiority which God has given man, he has abused in many respects by exercising arbitrary power. Infinite wisdom devised the plan of redemption, which places the race on a second probation by giving them another trial. End of quote. And that brings us to our two discussion questions for this week. One, God confronted Adam in Eden and asked him questions in order not only to establish his guilt, but also to lead him to repentance. This motif reappears with Cain... And we read this in Genesis 4, verses 9 and 10. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Then there's the flood, Genesis 6, verses 5 to 8. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11 verse 5. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And finally, Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and verse 21. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. If not, I will know. How is the idea of an investigative judgment revealed in these incidents? And two... Why did Eve think that eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil would give her wisdom? How could we avoid, in our context, making a similar mistake, that is, openly defying God's word in hope of something better than what God has offered us? Inside Story
Forgiven in Prison, Part 1 by Andrew McChesney The volunteers chose slips of paper with the names of inmates who had signed up for Bible studies at a prison in Spain. But nobody took one slip of paper. Doesn't anyone want to meet with this man? asked Dante Marvin Herman, a 36-year-old theology student at Segunto Adventist College. He's too difficult to work with, said one volunteer. He always mocks God, said another. Dante prayed and sensed a still small voice say, Go visit Matthias. A prison guard brought Matthias, a young, clean-shaven man, to Dante in an empty dining hall of the prisoner's maximum security block. Unlike the serial killers and other hardened convicts locked up in the block, Matthias didn't have any visible tattoos or an angry scowl on his face. You don't look like the other prisoners, Dante said. Matthias laughed. You don't know who I am, he said. I don't really care who you are or what you did, Dante said. We all have made mistakes in our lives, and we can't change the past. Matthias took a close look at Dante. He saw blue tattoos covering his arms and stretched out holes in his earlobes left by body piercing. Are you from the Seventh-day Adventist church? Matthias asked. You don't look like the other Adventists. God can change every one of us, Dante replied. He told how he had sold his soul to the devil at seventeen, joined a street gang, and worked as a drug dealer before finding the love of God in the Bible and becoming an Adventist. When he finished, the hour allotted for Bible study was up. "'Can you visit me again, please?' the inmate asked. "'I want to learn about this unknown God whom you spoke about. I've never heard about a loving God. I've only heard about an angry, condemning God.' Dante promised to return the next Sabbath. Back at the college, Dante mentioned Matthias to a teacher. Do you know who he is? The teacher asked. When Dante shook his head, the teacher suggested he go online and do a news search. The online search prompted Dante to pray. God, this is very serious, he said. Why did you send me to him? He sensed a still, small voice reply. Dante... I have grace for you. I have forgiven you. I can forgive him too. This mission story, which concludes next week, illustrates mission objective number two of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's I Will Go strategic plan to strengthen and diversify Adventist outreach among unreached and underreached people groups. Read more at IWillGo2020.org. The inmate's name has been changed. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. Sponsored by the Sabbath School Department and distributed through Hope Channel Australia, this podcast is also redistributed by Hope Channel Germany, Christian Record Services for the Blind. It is also available on SoundCloud and through multiple podcast distributors, including Apple iTunes. Remember, God is always faithful.